Thank you very much. Um, you talk about, you, you know, you're very energetic. You talk about society, the disputatiousness of the early Germanic models, the inclusivity, pushing from the top, pulling, pushing down from the bottom. But one of the things that I think emerged very well from both Frank's um, talk and the Q&A, which I know you weren't here for all of it, was the, 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 the notion of society being a single thing yeah. becomes more and more fractured. And one of the things about the Germanic tribes and about the early English in the north, going around with the state penetrating, collecting yeah. taxes, was they all looked the same pretty much. They all spoke the same language. They had a common religion. They had a lot of things that modern societies cannot rely on. Yeah. I, my, personal, my personal view is that all this discussion is kind of super, really overdone. You know, okay, that's like, just what Frank said, Karen. Yeah, which I, when I think about identity, you know, people have multiple identities. You know, like I have an identity, you know, I grew up as like a working class, you know, Englishman. You know, uh, I have a professional identity. You know, I have, you know, I have all sorts of different identities. You know, I'm English and I'm American and in being English is an ethnic identity. But being American is not an ethnic identity at all. You know, Asim, you know, he's a Pakistani and I could never be a Pakistani and probably he has some sub-Pakistani identity. And I'm English and you could never be English, but we can both be Americans, you know. So, so I think that's exactly what, uh, you know, Dr. Fukuyama was talking about. Like, that's a, that's a very different sort of identity. And maybe it's the sort of identity that, that, you know, would be much more advantageous. But I guess my view is that this sort of, like, you know, like, this, you know, now everyone's obsessed with kind of putting everyone in these boxes and talking about this, you know, Taj Fell's research in social psychology. I think identities are very flexible. You know, like, I worked a lot in sub-Saharan Africa, and everyone talks about ethnic identities. But in my experience, people have also have multiple identities in Africa. And everybody's willing to cooperate with everybody else, and you can switch it on. There's many cross-cutting ideologies, you know, there's many cross-cutting identities that cut across ethnicity, you know, where in Sierra Leone it could be we're all members of the secret society, or it could be, you know, we're joking cousins, and that cuts across many types of ethnic differences. So I, I think it's all a bit overdone. I'm kind of much more convinced that political institutions are important, and, you know, every society is diverse. Humans, you know, since the get-go have, like, migrated and moved around all over the earth. And successful societies are the ones that have created political institutions that can incorporate and deal with that diversity. So I don't think, uh, my perspective is not at all we should be coming up with clever ways of making little French people or English people or socializing them or brainwashing them or, you know, I don't think that's ever been very effective historically. And I don't think it's a way to have a kind of interesting, creative, vibrant society either. I think it's really, you know, of course, political entrepreneurs can exploit, can try to exploit, you know, switch on these different facets of your identity and, you know, call me an Englishman and look at all those terrible Polish people. But I, 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 I don't, you know, I, uh, my, I guess my view is, you know, my view is very different. I always think of like the Bible, you know, the Old Testament. I don't know if anyone knows the Old Testament. You know, in the Old Testament, the humans were very, the, probably, I can't remember, you know, some subset of the humans, maybe it was the Israelites, were full of hubris, and they made this thing called the Tower of Babel. So God came and punished them, and he made them speak lots of different languages so they couldn't talk to each other. But what I always find interesting, you know, in many African societies, there's similar myths, but it's never a punishment. You know, people go different ways, and they live together, and, but it's somehow like we're, we're living with some cultural legacy that this... <coughs> this diversity is like a punishment from God and somehow we have to kind of get rid of it and get over that. And, you know, but like people in other parts of the world are not like that in my experience. So I think it's a bit of a kind of Eurocentric discussion. So, so, so I would, you know, my sense is that it's polit it decay in political institutions. You know, I don't think Brexit is a result of, you know, intensification of British identity at all. You know, it's a result of political decay and economic inequality. Certainly not British. It might be English. That's a yeah. very different thing. Yeah. Um, okay, questions. Gentlemen over here. Yeah, and also a global fellow of the MasterCard Center. Um, two, I think, related questions. One is, is this meant to be predictive or is it just meant to be uh, analytic? And the second is, how teleological 
is this? I mean, the, uh, Frank Fukuyama talked about Germany and talked about the many, uh, I, I mean, uh, you started with Germany and the Holy Roman Empire yourself. Yeah. We know where that story ended uh, with the Nazis and we've seen now uh, uh, the recovery from this. So are you, so I'd be interested a little bit in the oscillations and the yeah. dynamics rather than this uh, arrow of history. Yeah. Um, and therefore, in a sense, um, is it too, uh, Joan Lai said it was uh, too early to judge the French Revolution. Is it too early to judge Chinese uh, evolution? Uh, no. I think that, you know, I think if you, if you think about the German history, you know, it's very interesting in the sense that there's definitely moments where you could say, you know, using my terminology, uh, that Germany jumps out of the corridor. You know, you could think of the creation of the absolutist state after the Thirty Years' War, for example, was not a situation, you know, the, these, these you know, accountable, institutions of accountability kind of atrophy, and, you know, the Germans go off onto this kind of militaristic state-building project which then collapses in 1806 at the Battle of Jena. And the interesting thing is, when it collapses, all these other things bounce back, you know. And it's true that the Weimar Republic, Germany, you know, jumps out of the corridor because there's enormous polarization and dis discontent, you know, created by the First World War and the aftermath and all these negative shocks of the Depression. But then what I find more interesting as a social scientist is that when that all collapses, what happens? You know, there's enormous consensus in German society about how to structure institutions, and the same kind of inclusive society bounces back. So I'm not saying all those dynamics are kind of uninteresting, and uh, trying to understand, you know, what makes a society kind of robust or fragile in those contexts, that's a very important question. But I guess here, you know, in 20 minutes, I just wanted to emphasize what to me is the big picture, which is that actually there's enormous historical continuity. So there's different frequencies you can look at. So is that predictive? Well, you know, it's as predictive as any social science theory could be. But I guess we're emphasizing here, like when I look at this, I see, gosh, you know, there's an awful lot of persistence in the world. You know, in fact, you know, if you look at contemporary Chinese history, you know, with Chairman Mao and Deng Xiaoping, or it mirrors in many ways many passages of historical China. So, so, you know, like China's always oscillated between these very totalitarian kind of top-down and more relaxed sort of Confucian periods of rule, and that's sort of what we've seen since 1978. So, so I think, like, the history helps you understand a lot what's going on in China, and it helps you understand a lot that these ideas about how modernization was going to create democracy in China is, like, wildly implausible, I would say. So there's a prediction for you. Over here. Hello, my name is Daniela Moy. I'm from Albania. I'm also a fellow at the Growth Lab here at the Center. So my question is more about a representation as opposed to identity. So in this construct of society that you have in your model, it kind of implies that historically we've had a very healthy middle class and that's where the competition to the state has come. But with this phenomenon of a missing middle and the hollowing out of the middle class, the competition and the power in society are very concentrated at the elite. So they're representing their interests and in lobbying for very specific demands. So the outcome in your model becomes that the inclusiveness is inherently exclusive. So given the effect of technology ramping, ramping up and kind of exacerbating this kind of polarization, is there any room now or in the future for Red Queen effects? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I don't think this is a story too much about the middle class, actually. You know, I mean, I think this is about participation in a kind of much deeper way than just the middle class. You know, I don't think, you know, I did, as Daron and I did a lot of work early on in our careers about democratization, you know, and what we learned from that is, you know, democratization was not something that was kind of created by middle classes. It was created by poor disenfranchised people getting organized. That's what created democracy in Western Europe, not middle classes. Middle classes were happy to have themselves enfranchised, but after that, they, you know, they didn't want to know. So, so I do think, you know, that, that you know, 
that there are enormous changes in the world in terms of inequality and polarization. So, you know, when I first came to the United States, you know, I, you know, we all used to joke about, you know, how Democrats were being English, you know, we all used to joke about how the Democrats and Republicans were all the same. That, that's not true anymore. You know, running this institute has really brought this home to me because you hire people and there's this discussion about whether they're Democrats and Republicans, which I actually find completely inappropriate. You know, but it's that polarized now. Like, oh, we don't want to hire, are they a Democrat? I'm like, why is that relevant? It's not relevant. What's relevant is their competence, you know, not their. So, so, so that polarization, I think, that creates, you know, an economic shocks. You know, we know from the work of David Alter and many people that, you know, there's enormous economic consequences of, of, of Chinese competition and, you know, people are suffering. You know, there's this enormous increase in inequality. But in some societies, you know, the remarkable thing is that you know, inequality is not at the level of the 19... Inequality might be at the level of the 1920s and 1930s in the United States and England, but it is not in France or Germany or Sweden or Netherlands or... So, so technological change or globalization is filtered through the types of political institutions you have and social policies. You know, the reason that things are so bad in Britain is because Mrs. Thatcher dismantled redistributive social policies, and that's why there's no counterbalancing to this, to this, this inequality. So I don't think it's a mystery why Brexit's happening. You know, my, my mother was, grew up in Middlesbrough in the north of England. If you go to, I could take you to Middlesbrough, I could take you to the street where she was born. It's boarded up. People are unemployed. You know, the only thing that's thriving, that's a good local word in Middlesbrough, the only thing that's thriving are the pubs. Uh, and they're discontent. All my relatives, they all voted for Brexit. All of them, absolutely all of them. You know, they're just neglected. They're, you know. Although it is worth remembering that the left behind were not the bulk of Brexit voters. They were affluent Middle England people over 65. Well, it's all about the blue, getting the blue well, passport back too. Yeah. I think there's something in that. <laughs> Lady over here, can we have a microphone? Hi, Susanna Campbell. I'm a professor at American University in DC. So I want to kind of ask you what can't be determined by history and what can't be explained by history. Because the story that you've told is one that's quite deterministic, where there are states that actually have this, the origins right, of strong states and societies, and we can expect them to go in a particular path. But what about those who don't? And what about, in particular, those that have experienced civil war, right, or in the midst of this conflict, which is the ultimate contestation right, between state and society? And in what that's supposed to form, many people who study Africa, of course, say that because of current porous borders and the interests of the elites, that that is actually not going to lead to the consolidation. So I kind of want to push you to explain the current situation in places like DRC, Sudan, South Sudan, even to some degree part of the conflict is taken, that has taken place in Kenya, to talk about what can't be explained by history and how you might see divergence in outcomes. Well, you know, I think, I think, you know, obviously this is a, this is a parsimonious attempt to talk about a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, if you ask me to talk about, uh, you know, the African case, I'd say, you know, history has enormous explanatory power. You know, think about, you know, why is Rwanda like Rwanda? You know, Rwanda was the most centralized, kind of autocratic, militarized, pre-colonial state in the whole of Africa. And they're able to tap into this history of organization, of, you know, uh, of militarization, in order, if they want, to create infrastructure, public goods, if they so want to. But, but, but if they also want to use that capacity for killing people, you know, they can, they can do that too. I think, you know, if you look at other countries like Botswana, why has Botswana been so successful since independence relative to most places in Africa? Because it was able to take traditional political institutions and actually scale them up to a level which provided some kind of accountability and legitimacy. You know, to me, that's the biggest, you know, the biggest problem in a Africa. But, you know, Africans at a local level, they have all sorts of institutions for controlling power and, you know, think of the TIV, but, you know, very flexibly. But that turned out to be very difficult to scale up to control post-colonial elites in the national capital. And there's been a little bit of progress on that, you could say, in Kenya and Ghana and Sierra Leone, but I don't see very much uh, progress 
uh, progress on that. You know, and, and you know, if you thought about the Sierra Leone case, talking about war and recovering from war, you know, Sierra Leone is not a development miracle at all, but it is a kind of stability miracle. And why is it a stability miracle? It's a stability miracle because, because the traditional institutions at the local level have been able to kind of reintegrate people, you know, reintegrate demobilized people from the RUF to kind of maintain their legitimacy and their coherence. Now, they don't look like, you know, what they're supposed to look like, you know, according to the World Bank's, you know, blueprint for modernization or whatever, but that's, that's what's legitimate, you know, and the development problem in Sierra Leone is how do I take that up, you know, how do I scale it up, you know, and that's what they did in Botswana kind of successfully. I mean, we can discuss whether that's how flexible that model is. I don't think terribly, but to me, that's the problem. You know, you need to, how do you scale that up? And we know we're so fixated on having elections and rotation of power. And I think that's a good thing. You know, that's, a, that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing in Sierra Leone. It's spread stuff around and, and you know, it kind of creates some sort of power sharing. Uh, but but it, doesn't, it doesn't have this transformative effect. Yeah, maybe it takes, you know, one of the reasons I like this corridor and this, you know, is that it emphasizes it's a process. You know, it's a process. It, and it's not, you know, you don't create it overnight. And I think that's, that's just the reality of it, you know. One last question over here. Oh, I'm, I'm definitely going to have you at the back because I failed to have you last time. Two last questions. Thanks very much, John Chisholm, San Francisco. I wonder if there's an analogy between a societal power and uh, uh, state power and uh, exploration slash discovery on the one hand and exploitation slash scalability on the other. Uh, if the people in the society are allowed to or able to discover uh, what interactions uh, enable them to uh, avoid conflict and, and uh, have win-win outcomes, uh, and, and, and customs emerge from that, and if the uh, state then uh, in, uh, is informed, uh, the laws that it puts in place are informed by those customs, then that's where, and, and then can scale up, as you were just saying, uh, the uh, customs of the, the society for efficiency and uh, cost effectiveness, then, and uniformity, uh, then that's when you end up in, perhaps in this uh, narrow corridor. Uh, and, and so a requirement then would be, if I'm interpreting it correct, correctly, for the for the uh, the laws of the state to be informed by the uh, customs and interactions. Ah, I think I mean that's that's very much what you see in this European experience. You know, it's not some kind of external blueprint. There's a there's a you know the, there's a real sort of iterative process between you know bottom up, you know, like taking things from society, codifying law, customs and principles which are sort of respected by people, norms in society, and then those change, of course they change, you know, like the, you know, the, they started importing, if you look at the Salic code, for example, or, you know, King Alfred's legal code in Britain, you know, it, it doesn't look anything like Roman law, of course the Romans had law, and there were even Roman lawyers floating about, but then stuff gets incorporated, you know, like there's a tussle, so, so, so there's a, but it's a very political process, you know, so, so I think that's what I want to emphasize. It's not like, my sense is, you know, it's, that it's not a very consensual process. There may be moments where we, we get together and, you know, but mostly it's a, it's a very contested process, this, this, this to and fro. Uh, so, so, you know, even, you know, even Philadelphia, you know, was pretty, George Mason wasn't happy, you know. Uh. At the back. Hi, hey, how are you? My name is Jose Morales. I'm a PhD candidate here at, at HKS. Um, <clears throat> so, so on the argument of, of balance between society and state, I think an er, a linear version of the argument was the consensually strong state. Uh, 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 in, uh, like like what, I, what I feel is that if you look at the experiences of recent drastic development shocks for the positive, uh, you hardly see, you hardly see 
society uh, or, or you hardly see a consensus, right? Like, like if you look at the case of Deng Xiaoping in China, if you look at the case of Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore, if you look at the case of the General Park in Korea, you, you see like strong state and a leader with a new idea, right? Uh, and, and then, you know, as, as, as the question was going on, on the role of history in determinism and what can break the, the logic of determinism, do you think leaders or, or ideas or, or, or what, what do you think are shocks to the system that can take you away from this path and, and, and do leaders and, and, and ideas play a role there? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's a very interesting uh, paper by um, Ben Olkin at MIT and Ben Jones who's at Northwestern about lead called, called Do Leaders call, Cause Growth? And they, it, they did the following exercise. They looked at the economic consequences of leaders but when they die in office, okay, so like they have a heart attack or, you know, Samora Michelle's plane crashed or whatever it was, you know. Uh, so, so that's like, it, that's the, the, the end of that leadership can't be explained by, you know, economic performance or society getting rid of them because they didn't like them or whatever. So it's like exogenous, you know, in the language of economics. So what they, they found two very interesting things. They found leadership matters a lot for economic growth. So actually, you know, you do find Chairman Mao dies, you know, Deng Xiaoping comes in, uh, leadership, you know, growth zooms up. You know, Secutore dies in Guinea, you know, there's been economic decline for 20 years, bang, the economy starts growing. So, you know, they find big, but when they split the data into uh, countries with you know, they look at autocracies and democracies. So, you know, like political institutions, countries with more, parti politi more participatory political institutions and those without, they find no effect in, there's no effect in countries with participatory institutions. So I guess that's my view, my view of the world that like, you know, in, 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 you know, in a very autocratic society or where there's a lot of power concentrated, then individuals' projects or their ambitions or their ideas can obviously have an effect. And I think, you know, we see that in history. But, but, but when you strengthen institutions, it becomes, you know, it becomes much less, much less important. You know, I always give the Botswana example. Many people, since I did all this research in Botswana, ask me, oh, yeah, yeah, but Botswana was so lucky. They had this Tsaretsi karma, you know, after independence. He was, like, really serious. He didn't care. He wasn't, you know, he wanted to build institutions. And true, he did, you know. But... Before that, he was his uncle, Shikeli Karma. He, same thing. His grandfather, Karma the Great, was even better. You know, he revolutionized Swana society in the late 19th century. He gave up the supernatural powers of the chieftaincy. Uh, he abandoned the entire system of clientelism, which worked through cows. You know, like he had all these cows, he lent them out. And he just said, you know, forget that. Just keep the cows. Uh, keep the cows. Okay, so, so, so what strikes me about Botswana is... There's enormous history of leadership, you know, and that's to do with the, the political institutions, it seems to me. So, so, so that, that's kind of my view about, I think it's obvious, you know, it's just too obvious to be denied that, you know, there's no kind of, if Hitler had died, you know, in 1920, you know, then there wasn't somebody just coming along and to pop up. There's not an infinitely elastic supply of like alternative Hitlers. Some people are just very charismatic, you know, they have SAV. Uh, we don't know how Hitler acquired it, but but he had SAV, uh, and you know, that people like that can do a lot of damage in, you know, in weakly institutionalized societies, I guess. Uh, but you know, the message you know, is not to rely on leadership, but to build institutions. Very good, can we show our appreciation of Jim, please?